Hello and welcome to NPTEL MOOC on electromagnetic wave propagation in guided and wireless media. Uh, in this week 1, module 1, we are going to look at transmission lines. In this week, we are going to study a few characteristics of transmission lines, understand its frequency domain and time domain behavior and then in the next week, we are going to apply these concepts uh, to some practical applications. Uh, mainly to do with signal integrity and for uh, you know uh, RF and microwave uh, design. Okay. What is a transmission line? To put it simply, a transmission line is any structure, a physical structure which is usually made out of a conductor uh, which can guide electromagnetic waves from point A to point B. The most familiar type of transmission lines that you have seen corresponds to a pair of wires okay, which have in this case I have shown you that they have a certain cross section uh, and then they are essentially uniform along one of the directions and these pair of wires carry voltages and currents from one point to another point. Of course, we talked about electromagnetic waves and now you may question as to why am I talking about voltages and currents. It turns out that in this uh, transmission line theory, it is possible for us to still deal with the voltages and currents and only when the frequency increases so much that compared to the structure that we are looking at or the wavelength reduces so much to the structure that we are looking at that we need to really bring in the concepts of electric field, magnetic field and to consider the electromagnetic field behavior. So, for, for the case that we are considering here, it is not necessary that we study the fields or we are concerned with the fields uh, of the transmission lines although we are uh, in some sense as we will see later on, but the description in terms of voltages and currents is, but is very good, it is an approximation, but it is an excellent approximation and it will tell us many things about waves that uh, we can apply later on when we study electromagnetic waves as well. Okay? So, coming back to the transmission line, we have a pair of wires, although it is not visible, I have not really written it nicely, the wires are assumed to be uniform along one of the directions and we really assume that these waves are quite or rather sorry, these lines are essentially extending to quite a long distance. Okay? Of course, I want to launch a certain voltage or a current, the way I will do it is to connect these wires to some source and let us say the source has a certain voltage source or sorry the certain internal resistance R s okay? and then this will usually be the pair of wires is usually used to connect to a load whose resistance I am assuming it to be equal to R l. So, I have taken these simple resistances in practice the load may consist or include a few inductive and uh, capacitive parts as well for simplicity we have assumed that the load consists of only R L and this is R S. Now, as I am writing these pictures, I want you to picture an experiment in your mind where this V S R S comes from the function generator. So, you may imagine that you have actually are sitting on a table or you are actually you know uh, standing in front of a table I am sorry and then you have a function generator kept you know and that R s is of course, internal to the function generator. So, it is not accessible to you and you are taking out a pair of wires. Okay. They could be instead of these two wires, they could be a coaxial cable, but the basic idea still remains the same. I have taken two pair of wires or a pair of conductors and then I have connected them to the load and the load could simply be an oscilloscope. Okay. So, the load that I have here written as R l could simply be one of the channels of an oscilloscope. So, let us just imagine this experiment in our mind and then we see what happens as we let the voltage source uh, be applied from by turning on the function generator. Now, as soon as the function generator is turned on, there is something that is going to happen which we are not going to look at it at this moment. What we will assume is that this source has been turned on for quite some time, you know, maybe about 10-15 days ago it was turned on 
and then you are viewing this right now okay so that is the basic idea though the 10 15 is not really uh, practical what i am saying but mathematically we will assume that the source has been turned on for quite some time and what we call as transients have all died down right you do remember the transients right when you turn the switch on on any circuit you will see that the solution will even you know will oscillate a little bit or will change a little bit what is called as transient response and eventually settles down to what is called as steady state response and i am interested in that steady state response in this particular problem to give you some ideas to actually what i am looking at i will mention that the voltage source is about 1 volt peak to peak so it is generating a sinusoidal signal of 1 volt peak to peak and then i will assume that rl is equal to rs we don't really want to bother about you know the ratios or anything like that so rl we will make it equal to rs and I will take the frequency of the source. This is a sinusoidal signal. So, the sinusoidal signal has a frequency of let us say uh, about uh, 100 kilohertz. Okay? I have a 100 kilohertz source and I have turned it on for quite some time and I am going to look at this on an oscilloscope. Right? So, I am going to look at this as an oscilloscope. If you do not have an oscilloscope, it is fine. This is just a thought experiment. Okay. Of course, you can also write, I mean do this experiment, but when you think of this, this is what you are expected to see. right? So, this is a 1 volt peak to peak, therefore, this is about 0.5 volt and this is nicely the way in which your sinusoidal signal from the function generator would look. right? And this is what the oscilloscope would of let us say channel 1 of the oscilloscope would uh, show to you. right? So, this is 0.5 volt because I assumed 1 volt peak to peak. All right. Now, let me mention that the length of this two piece, I mean the wire is about uh, 10 centimeter, right. So, this length is about 10 centimeter. Now, for 10 centimeter length, right, um, that let us calculate uh, the frequency F naught that we have calculated, I mean that we have assumed is about 100 kilohertz, right. What would be the corresponding wavelength lambda naught? Wavelength lambda naught will be C by F naught and c is basically 3 into 10 to the power 8 and the frequency is about 100 kilohertz. So, that is 100 into 10 to the power 3. So, this will be equal to about 300 meters. Right? The wavelength of this source will be about equal to about 300 meters. So, at this point wavelength does not really matter to us I mean or it will not, it seems that it does not matter to us and you do not have to really worry about the wavelength part. Okay? The importance of wavelength will come out shortly. But look at this thing. So, I have a wire which is about 10 centimeter long and then I have a signal whose frequency is about 100 kilohertz whose wavelength of course is about 300 meter. I mean this is just a number as at this particular point. Okay. Now, what will be the voltage that I am going to see at the load? That is an interesting question. So, let us look at what we are going to see on the load. Right? What do you expect? Now, from the circuit theory point of view, the answer is very simple. There is a voltage uh, generator V s, there is a resistance R s, these conductors being ideal, right? no losses that we have assumed. Therefore, there is nothing that these conductors are doing or the pair of wires are doing. So, the entire thing is actually equivalent to a circuit and the load should be exactly equal to the source voltage here because these are all resistors as such, but the amplitude will be half of what the source voltage is. Why would it be half? Because we have R s is equal to R l. So, the voltage gets divided between R s and R l and therefore, you would expect this kind of a voltage. right? So, you would expect this voltage to come out. So, you should actually expect that the voltage would be about a sinusoidal signal and it peaks wherever the original signal is peaking and it goes to 0 wherever the original signal is going to 0. right? So, if there are two waves or if there are two voltages that are in this particular manner, uh, then these two are called as voltages being in phase with respect to each other. So, this is what you would actually expect. right? Fine, this is all seems to be all right. Now, let me change the length from 10 centimeter I'm, and I am going to make this one into about a kilometer. right? So, I am going to make this one into about 1 kilometer or maybe about 10 kilometer. Now, you are you can again think of this experiment, you know you have kept the function generator, you have kept the load unchanged, but then you have to wrap in 10 kilometer uh, copper pair of wire. So, how you do it is something that you can do it. 
or you can go and grab an electrical power line cable line that is running uh, over a length of 10 kilometers and connect your source and an oscilloscope at the other end. But this is a thought experiment, so you do not have to do any of that. But from your circuit theory point of view, can you take a moment, pause the video if you want, but take a moment, think has the situation changed really, right. Just because I change the length of the wire from say 10 centimeter to 10 kilometer, from circuit theory point of view, has my situation changed? Has anything changed at all? If you have paused, thought about it and then now you say that there is no change from circuit theory point of view, you will be absolutely correct. Circuit theory simply does not care what length of the line that you have used. For it, a 10 centimeter line is the same thing as about a 10 kilometer line. In fact, it does not even worry about the shape of the line. So, you could for all practical purposes take this pair of wires and then bend them, twist them, do whatever that you want. From the circuit point of view, it still remains the same. The voltage at the load end oscilloscope, the display on the oscilloscope will still continue to be a sinusoidal signal of the same frequency and the amplitude of half with the important point that peaks where the original wave peaks and or rather the original voltage peaks and goes through 0 where the original voltage goes through 0. When I say original, I mean the source voltage, right. But what you actually see, if you were to do this experiment, what you actually see will be something that will be, what would I say? I would say radically different. Yes, that is a good word. What you would see is that the amplitude is still okay. I mean, it is small, but then the wave seems to be not starting at the same point. It is not, so where the wave is going through a peak, the source has already gone to a peak before that, where the wave is starting at this 0. So, the voltage at the load uh, is starting after a certain delay, it seems that way or at least there is a phase difference between the two waves and this phase difference we will denote it by theta and this phase difference is actually because of the physical delay in sending the voltage from the source side to the load side, right. And this difference would be negligible or would not even show up on your oscilloscopes if the line length were to be very small, right. So, if the wires that you have connected happens to be very, very small, then you do not even see this difference theta, although for all uh, you know uh, uh, theoretical purposes, this delay will always exist. And this delay, there is nothing mysterious about it. It is simply saying, I mean, it is simply the fact that the line or the pair of wires which have been connected have to physically take the electromagnetic wave from one point to another point and in doing so, the length essentially gives you a delay, right. And that delay in the case of a sinusoidal signal turns out to be in the form of a phase delay or a phase shift theta. So, if the voltage here at the source side can be written as say some sin 2 pi 100 kilohertz T, right the voltage at the load side can be written as sin 2 pi 100 kilohertz, which is still the same thing. I mean, the frequency is not changed, but there is a phase theta, right. So, there is a phase delay that or a phase shift that this uh, voltage at the load experiences when compared to the uh, voltage that you will see uh, on the source, right. So, these two are essentially shifted by a factor of theta and the load voltage is actually delayed by the factor or by the phase value of theta. Now, again think a little bit carefully, is this theta dependent on the length of the wire? It would certainly seem so, like if I instead of considering a 10 kilometer uh, pair of wires, if I consider 100 kilometer pair of wire, I mean the pair of wires having a length 100 kilometer long, then surely the amount of phase shift or the phase delay that you are going to see will also change. Perhaps the phase shift will be looking at like this now, right. So, this will be the new phase shift that I am seeing uh, or maybe I did not write it correctly, but this is the phase shift that I am seeing and this phase shift certainly is a function of the length of the wires that is connecting the source and the load. All these things, the fact that there is a phase shift between the voltages at the source or phase shift between the voltage of the source and the load is not really predicted by the circuit theory. So, circuit theory will tell you that does not matter whether it is 1000 kilometers or 1 million kilometers, the voltage at the load will always 
go through zeros where the voltage at the source will go through zeros and the two voltages would always be in phase with respect to each other. They are not shifted by any phase whatsoever, but physically we know that it cannot happen. Physically there has to be certain delay and that delay will cause the phase to shift or phase to change and that phase difference is something that is dependent on the length as well. Of course, as I said I have also assumed that these structures or these wires are smooth, they do not change their cross section, they are not twisted, they are not done anything and we have also assumed that these two are essentially lossless at this particular point, but in practice you cannot find a conductor which is zero loss, right. I mean there are those superconductors, but even those exhibit some amount of loss. So, it is certainly possible and it is in fact uh, will happen that the wires or the materials that we use, the conducting materials that we use will always be lossy and one has to take into account that amount of loss when thinking about the model for this situation. Moreover, uh, as I have told you while the two you know wire uh, transmission line is the simplest one that is not the only transmission line. In fact, you probably have already seen, I have already mentioned this in the introduction video. This is what is called as a coaxial cable and a coaxial cable will actually look something like this. It will have an inner conductor and then it has an outer conductor here okay, and then surrounding the outer conductor is a plastic sheath just to kind of give it a mechanical protection and also to contain the fields within that and this is an example of a transmission line. And on a printed circuit board if you look at from the top you will see that there is a you know IC here, this IC to another IC let us say at this point, these two pins are actually connected by a pair of or by a conducting path which is called as a trace ok. So, this is called as a trace or a PCB trace and then below this somewhere on the PCB will be a what is called as a ground plane ok. The ground acts as a reference and if you look at the trace in the cross section wise you will see that this is what it would look like. So, this is your trace right. So, this is the trace and this is your ground plane ok. So, this is your ground and in between of course, is whatever the material that the PCB material is made out of. So, this is a dielectric and currents are being carried by this trace ok. So, I am just extending this to show you how the structure would look like. So, this trace would carry a current forward current I f as we would call it and this ground plane would carry what is called as a reverse current or the return current ok. And this structure, this transmission line structure is called as a microstrip and instead of considering a microstrip uh, you may also consider what is called as a shielded microstrip. A shielded microstrip is essentially the you know uh, uh, it is it's essentially uh, a box kind of a structure that is that is surrounded that is surrounding the top trace. So, that the fields which are radiated we will come to those things later on the fields which are radiated are not coupling you know coupled outside and then cause electromagnetic interference to the next uh, components. Uh, so, these are what are called as shielded microstrip lines. You will also find additional types as I have told you strip lines then you will also find that there is what is called as a coplanar line ok. So, this is the main line and these two are essentially the ground lines. So, all these variations that we consider, so these are called as CPW lines, this is a shielded microstrip line. So, these transmission lines are essentially characterized by a certain common characteristics. So, one of the characteristics is that they are uniform along at least one direction, right. So, along a particular direction that is the cross section remains the same whether I am looking at the wires now or wires, I mean wires here or wires at a after a certain length right. So, there is no sudden change bump or you know uh, depression or some sort of a twisting or curling or bending none of those things are happening to these lines ok. So, we call them as uniform transmission lines and they are uniform along a particular direction which we traditionally associate with z axis or z axis ok. So, this is what we have. The second characteristic is that uh, these lines are uh, and, and this is actually because of the first characteristic itself, these lines are what is called as propagation or transmission lines in the sense that I will explain that in a minute. So, they are only concerned with propagation of electromagnetic waves or 
voltages and currents of course, in this particular case voltages and currents and they are, they do not they are not meant to radiate any of these voltages. Actually voltages do not radiate what radiates are the electromagnetic fields and there is a relationship between electromagnetic uh, quantities uh, electric field and magnetic field to voltages and currents which we are going to explore it later on. But for our purposes because this structure is uniform what we expect is only propagation of the waves not really the kind of you know uh, radiation that is associated with an antenna. Although practical transmission lines do radiate a little bit we do not really worry about that part until quite some time. Okay. Then in a strict, uh, strict sense transmission lines do only propagate waves because they are uniform along a particular direction. Okay. And I mean this is another important characteristic they all contain two conductors. Now do not get me wrong it is possible to have more than two conductors. Okay. Uh, however, the fundamental transmission line theory is, all, all is concerned with two conductor transmission line. Extension to multi conductor transmission lines is rather an important topic which is very practical as well because in a real scenario you will see many many conductors on a printed circuit board definitely you are going to see more than two conductors and any two pairs of conductors can actually be considered as a transmission line and therefore multi conductor transmission line theory is an important topic which unfortunately we were not going to cover in this particular course. So, for us all the transmission lines that we consider have only two conductors and this is another very important characteristic the transmission lines are really the transmission lines. right? Now, you may be puzzled as to what am I talking about here let me give you a, uh, what I am talking about. We saw in the first um, you know uh, slide here that you had a source and you had a load here correct and then the frequency we mentioned it to be about 100 kilohertz and the corresponding wavelength although you may not really worry about what the wavelength is the wavelength turned out to be about 300 meters right. Transmission line theory formally is applied to any structure okay, which interacts with electromagnetic waves uh, when the length of those structures are essentially in the same order of magnitude of wavelength lambda. Okay. You have seen two different cases actually one you would have seen the case where L is much much larger than lambda this is what is called as the ray optic approach meaning the physic the wavelength of the electromagnetic wave is so small that the structure looks very big right. It is like a bulb that is there at the center of this particular room whereas the room is in few feet right or about meters or so the wavelength of the light is just about 600 nanometers or 0.6 micrometer. So, if you look at the ratio of L to lambda that is actually a very very large number and in that case you can think of electromagnetic waves light being one of the electro I mean light being an electromagnetic wave as well as being propagated in straight lines and the familiar phenomenon of you know reflection refraction of light uh, is essentially part of this particular thing called as ray optic approach. Okay. You can apply ray optic approach to any structure whose length is much much larger than lambda. On the other hand you would have also seen the case where length is much 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 smaller than lambda and this is what is called as a lumped element regime and this is called as a lumped circuit regime meaning that my wavelength is so large that on the structure the physical delay between two points right. So, if you have a sinusoidal wave here the sinusoidal wave will actually be the same at the other point on the line as well or on the wire as well simply because the length of the wire is so small that the distance and the corresponding phase shift is considered to be 0 right. In an ideal scenario L is much I mean the lambda is actually infinity meaning that when you change voltage at a particular point the wire immediately reflects other end the wire immediately reflects the change in the voltage and therefore you are going to see uh, this voltage uh, to be the exact same thing in phase with the this one. So, what we actually are considering is transmission lines meaning that the length of those structures are comparable to wavelength they are not very large with respect to wavelength nor they are very small with respect to lambda and it is in this region we are going to talk about the transmission lines and we actually start uh, the study of transmission lines in the next uh, module 
by first considering a model for this transmission line. Now, let me point out an important thing. When we write down a resistor, we have a certain circuit symbol for that, we write this as resistor R, but physically that is not a resistor, right? Physically it is actually composed of a material, a resist material, right? With a certain uh, characteristic such that the leads when you, when they come out, this is the actual physical resistor. The physical resistor that you have will have certain amount of resistance R and if there is a certain current I through the resistor and the voltage V across this particular resistor, what circuit theory will tell us is that as the voltage increases, the current keeps on increasing for a constant resistance R and the ratio of this one will actually be equal to R, right? So, it does not matter whether voltage is 10 volts or 100 volts or 1 million volt, the corresponding current will always be given by V by R and that will also keep changing. But on a physical resistor, that is not going to happen. If you apply say 100 volt to a quarter watt resistor, you would have almost burnt out the resistor. What you would actually see is nice smoke coming out from the resistor. This is not what you want. And in that sense, this physical resistor is no longer dictated by the mathematical equation that applies to the ideal resistor, right? So, this is your physical structure, right? This is a physical device or a physical structure and this is a symbol and this relationship given in the graphical format is the mathematical model, right? Mathematical model tells you that the voltage across the resistor R is given by V equals R i, keep changing one of the quantities and this is what you are going to get. So, this is a mathematical relationship and this relationship actually breaks down. If you want to be little clever about the mathematical relationship or the mathematical model, you would say as long as the power across the resistor is less than about say one fourth of a watt, right? So, if you supplement the main equation by this auxiliary condition, then you have improved the mathematical model, right? You may even improve it further by considering that these lines which are coming out, they are actually leads, right? So, these leads which are coming out, they actually have a little bit of a inductance, right? And this inductance plus the lead being made out of a certain physical material will also have its own resistance R, right? So, this is your inductance of the lead and this is your lead resistance. There will also be an inductor on this side and there will be a resistor here. So, you again have a lead and for the simplicity assuming that both leads have the same value of L and R and along with this there is a made actual value of the resistance R. So, if you were to look at the complete model or a better model you would find that the model actually consists of the value of R for which the resistance is rated or it is taken plus there are these inductance and you know additional resistances, additional inductance and additional resistance that comes as part of being the physical wires that are coming out or physical leads that are coming out, okay? So, with that uh, what I want to emphasize is that in the following uh, weeks when we talk about we are mostly talking about the mathematical models. We are of course going to look at the physical aspects of the devices or the structures as well, but we are going to make a lot of assumptions. Those assumptions are usually well chosen. I mean if I do not choose my assumptions correctly, then I can predict all kinds of nonsense thing out there, but those assumptions are chosen such that they explain the phenomenon uh, with as little as possible those assumptions are and while I am looking at that, you have to always uh, keep in mind that when I draw a transmission line by writing two straight lines, the form of the actual transmission line will be different and perhaps whatever I am doing on the paper here by drawing two lines is not adequately representing that particular physical device. It, it, it is, it will represent in that device in many, many cases to a very good approximation, but you should also remember where these approximations break down and how to go about improving those approximations. So, that is the division between or that is the divide between what is called as a physical device and its mathematical model. Those wires which I am drawing, they are all symbols, right? So, in the next uh, module, we begin formally to look at models of transmission line and it is surprising that all these different types of transmission lines can be given uh, or can be described by almost a same set of equations as we are going to see next. Mm -hmm.